Let's go. <laughs> what is yeah. he going in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just keep moving. Oh, oh, oh! He's sliding! Oh my god! While that might not sound that drastic, it makes a pretty big difference to the ecosystem. If the trend continues for a few decades, these areas could start to look like woodlands as the shrubs grow to tree height. That's not a <laughs> If there's one aspect of games that most people agree on when it comes to games criticism, it's that glitches are bad. If a game is buggy, if it's glitchy, if it just kind of does something that doesn't feel intentional or part of the game's world, we see that as a flaw. Media criticism is complicated. Everyone goes into a game with different perspectives and experiences that will influence the way they experience that game, and rarely, if ever, can a part of those experiences be measured in an objective manner. However, we're human beings. We don't deal well with abstractions. We like concrete things. We like sticky stuff. We like things we can point at and say, that thing is the thing that I see with my eyes. It's helpful for us to at least have some tangible foundation on which we can build up our critical analysis. Even critics who believe that objective art criticism is impossible will often unconsciously establish baseline questions. How does the game perform? Is it well optimized? Does it function properly? Does the game run well? The answers to these questions are often seen as self-evident. If the game answers no to either of them, then the game is unquestionably flawed. Now, of course, all art is imperfect in some way. A perfect piece of art is impossible, it doesn't exist. But I think the way that we understand glitches is very muddled and underdeveloped, in part because of common priorities in games criticism. See, in most other media, the functionality of the medium itself is rarely, if ever, a concern. You'll rarely read a book review that comments on the quality of the paper, or a movie review that warns about bad camera quality, because these mediums have developed production standards that effectively make these non-issues. In fact, sometimes a book or movie will break these standards for a specific artistic purpose, and while art like this usually might not have widespread appeal, these artistic moves are usually recognized for the contributions they bring to the work as a whole and sometimes they might even be massively successful and spawn entirely new genres. In games, however, poor optimization, bad port jobs, and general lack of polish are common problems across the medium. So when someone goes to a game review, one of the things they're often looking for is if the game runs well. On the surface, this is perfectly reasonable, but one of the knock-on effects of this is that what we consider running well or finished has become standardized. There's a common, inflexible standard of not just the production of a game, but of its fidelity. What a game should look like, what it should feel like, what a game should intend to do, and games that don't fit into the industry standard are considered dysfunctional. There's no point in analyzing what are considered glitches or oversights because they fall outside the constructed baseline of functionality. Meanwhile, more higher order aspects of a game, such as art direction, writing, character design, combat, and world design, all have the privilege to be considered subjective. Never mind that intent and what a game is trying to do are constructed ideas that players make up as they go along. If something doesn't feel intended, it loses the right to be considered a part of the game. One of the big reasons for this is because of the language we use to describe glitches. You've got the synonyms, starting with bug, defect, and so on. You've got the slightly more charitable oversight, which attributes imperfections to developers' negligence instead of incompetence. When glitches are used to play the game in a way that wasn't intended, we call it sequence breaking. And when they prevent you from playing the game as intended, they're game breaking. All these terms characterize glitches as undesirable things that should be avoided, or imagine an intention behind design that prevents a glitch from being considered a legitimate component of the game. This assumption of intention is part of why glitches are often seen as objective flaws, 
because to a layperson, it's easy to assume the creators are an authority over your artistic experience, and that anything that doesn't seem to fit with that vision is a problem. But it turns out, the deeper you dig into the play of a game, and how players interact with it, the questions of whether glitches are bad, or what is even considered a glitch, becomes a lot more complex. It's me, Mario! Hello! The speedrun of Super Mario 64 is one of the most famous speedruns out there. Not only because it's one of the most influential games ever, but because the game gives the player a wide variety of options for how to move. Mario has so many different ways he can move, which can be combined and twisted in even more ways to discover faster routes. The game is the piano of 3D platformers. Easy to get into, but difficult to master. However, one particular move has long been controversial in the community, the backwards long jump. It's effectively a method of achieving limitless speed. It's a consequence of the game not putting a limit on how fast Mario can go backwards. It's really useful, it allows players to speed up the infinite staircase fast enough to get to the final level, instead of simply gathering enough power stars to unlock it. However, it's been debated whether this maneuver should be allowed in the glitchless category. It's argued that the endless stairs are intended to be climbed with 70 power stars, and that the inputs needed to perform the maneuver are pretty abnormal. It's also just, like, looks really weird. Even in the Mario world, it's pretty hard to believe that a chubby plumber could be able to move like this. For many, this is enough for the backwards long jump to be considered a defect, but this implies that it isn't a legitimate part of the game, which has some problems. For one, the game gives the player so many different tools for traversing the world. There's the long jump, triple jump, dive, ground pound jump, wall kick, wall jump, all perform with different inputs of only two buttons and a control stick. If the backwards long jump is achieved by the same means, who's to say that it shouldn't be considered a part of Mario's moveset? You'll also hear it argued that a layer re-release patched the backwards long jump out, which means it's a glitch. However, you could also make the argument that changing the game so radically as adding a limit to backwards momentum effectively makes this re-release a different game from the original Mario 64. It was also only released in Japan until Mario 3D All-Stars, so the original Mario 64 is the game that most of the world knows. Most important though is just how frequently the move is used by players. It's been used so many times, not just by speedrunners, simply because being able to build up endless speed is useful and fun. Even if the desires never intended the move to be used, which let's be honest they probably didn't, it's been given a legitimacy just because of how it's used. It emerged from the game's mechanics and has become a part of the way that people play the game. Maybe you're still uncomfortable with this. Maybe you'd be more comfortable calling this an exploit then, something that emerges from the game's mechanics and that players frequently use that doesn't deserve as much legitimacy as other mechanics. But then you would have to answer, what makes this mechanic less legitimate than others? Is it the fact that it's less diegetically believable? Does the supposed unintentionality make it less legitimate? If you believe either of these things, I think you could make a reasonable argument for why that is, but in doing so, you would have to make judgments about the value of player input and authorial intent. You would have to explain how the work itself communicates intent, and why that informs the game's structure more than player interactions do. You would need to defend why the game should be observed as a prelapsarian lockbox that exists in its purest form before anyone actually plays it. In other words, you would need to make a subjective argument, which says more about the way you see games than the quality of the game itself. Like, has anyone actually tried to argue that the mere existence of the backwards long jump makes Mario 64 a worse game? Does anyone actually think the Shindo version is better because it was patched out? I think it'd be hard pressed to find someone who has an actual argument for why that is, other than that it's a glitch. So what do we even call it then? A bug? An exploit? What about an oversight? This is a somewhat less negative connotation, but again, it still privileges the idea that designer's intent has authority over a game's design. Which, if you have a lot of experience in game design, or just any creative work at all, you'll recognize that this doesn't quite make sense either. In his video, The Games That Design Themselves, Mark Brown talks about games where the most interesting ideas they develop come not from designers as perfectly conceived concepts, but from putting mechanics together and seeing how players interact with them. 
Rocket League, for example, started out as just a soccer game with cars until they added a boost mechanic that ended up launching cars far into the air. Instead of fixing the mechanic to keep players close to the ground, they built the rest of the game around this, because it turns out this unintentional mechanic made the game a lot more fun and dynamic. If things like this are considered glitches just because they don't agree with the designer's original intent, then the potential of a game can end up going to waste. This goes for pretty much all art. Failing forward isn't just about creating something imperfect, it's about taking those imperfections and seeing how they can lead to making something entirely different and better than you originally envisioned. It's about the nature of the art changing depending on how people interact with it. Think about open world games. How many times have you climbed mountains in Skyrim and Far Cry by jumping on them like a mountain goat? Is it a bug? Is this an oversight? It was considered those things for a long time, but no developer has had any way to fix it, so it just kind of stayed this way for years. Until Breath of the Wild embraced the idea wholeheartedly and decided to turn climbing into a core feature. Does this make climbing in Breath of the Wild better than in other open world games? I don't think so, but it does show that games can get a lot more creative when players and designers see imperfections less as bugs to be fixed, and more as phenomena to be experimented with and built upon. But that's not the end of it. No, 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 that's not even the beginning. Because if you really want to see the power imperfections have in games, then you have to look at games that turn glitches themselves into features. These games are riddled with what would usually be considered glitches. However, instead of changing them, they use those glitches as a way to explore their mechanics and ideas in a way that very few of their contemporaries even attempt. And I can think of few games that do this better than the Anodyne games. Anodyne 1 and 2 are developed by Analgesic Productions, an indie team composed of Melo Santani and Marina Ayano. They're both really great games, and in order to say what I have to say, I'm going to have to spoil some pretty big parts about them, so if you haven't played either of them, I highly recommend that you do before continuing. They're both pretty short and linked in the description. Now, before we go on, I want to stress that using glitchiness as an element of game design is nothing new. Some more well-known examples are things like the Sanity System in Eternal Darkness or the Psycho Mantis fight from Metal Gear Solid. More recently, it's become popular in many indie games, things like the flowy fight in Undertale, the hacking segment from Secret Little Haven, and the later half of Doki Doki Literature Club. However, one thing that kind of bothers me about these designs is that they're not really glitches so much as things designed to resemble glitches. You can't finish these games without experiencing them. As a player, you can feel that these sequences push a feeling of brokenness to the forefront, but only on an aesthetic level. Like, the screen cracking over Monica's face isn't actually because the game's files are corrupted, you can tell there's a filter applied by the game to make it look like that. The game wants you to feel like your expectations are shattered and surprised because of how meta the game is, and overall, this is fine. I think this approach to fourth wall breaking is a bit indulgent, but I like these games, and I think they're generally improved by their glitchiness aesthetic. But I do wish there were more games that presented glitchiness as not just an aesthetic, but as an inextricable part of the game. The Endodyne games do exactly this, and in a very subdued way. The glitches in these games feel organic, they feel emergent of the game's design, a product of lack of control. They feel like glitches because, well, they are. But even though the games don't control these glitches, they use them for a very unique purpose. On the surface, Anodyne 1 is a pretty simple 2D Zelda-inspired exploration game. If you get a bit deeper into it, you'll discover that the game explores a lot of really bizarre and unsettling themes in ways that I won't spoil here. At the end of the game though, the game gives you something called the Swap Tool, which allows the player to swap the position of any two tiles. This cracks the game wide open. The player can use this tool to go out of bounds, access inaccessible areas, and... 
Okay, hold up. In this game, the main collectible is cards. You spend the whole game collecting them and need cards in order to get through various gates throughout the game. The main game has 37 cards, even though your menu has 48 inventory slots for some reason. Anyway, you need 36 to get to the last level of the game. But the real kicker is, those inaccessible areas have even more cards in them. In fact, there's a total of 49 cards in the game, so even the menu that hinted at the existence of more cards was also lying to you. And I mean, just by looking at it, you might think the swamp tool doesn't fit into this world. It turns the screen into a bundled mess of tiles that don't fit together, and there are no areas that even attempt to make structured use out of the tool, because you just can't. So does this make the mechanic bad? Not really. It's a purposeful mechanic that completely changes the way the player interacts with the game. And considering that Anodyne is largely about using games as a way of escaping one's fears of the world, giving the player the ability to break the game in order to discover a bunch of hidden collectibles is kind of relevant. But then we get to Anodyne 2, which does something entirely different. At one point in the story, you gain the ability to collect these things called Metacoins. They're scattered everywhere throughout the world. There's so many of them that unless you're deliberately trying not to collect them, you're inevitably going to pick some up. You can use them to purchase all kinds of meta-related content in the menu. Developer logs, these free associative journal entries, even old debug rooms and old models of the game's areas, it's pretty neat. On the outskirts of the world, if you drive along this fence, you'll notice a line of meta coins that are just far enough apart that you'll probably pick them up in your car. By this point, you've probably noticed this weird glitch where if you drive your car along a wall, it'll maintain its vertical position while it's driving. If you try that here, you'll notice that the invisible wall above the fence can actually be crossed if you drive far enough along it, allowing you to drive through these mountains and dunes until the literal edge of the world. Oh yeah, this soundtrack is really fucking good, by the way. And, if you drive long enough, eventually you'll find... more... metacoins. And the most fascinating thing about this that you might have noticed is that the game has been preparing you to find these coins all along. In the first town in the game, one of the residents is absurdly tall, almost taller than the buildings, you can't miss him, and he tells you that you can walk on one of the walls nearby even if it doesn't seem like you can. The meta coins are everywhere because the game wants you to get used to picking them up. The coins along the fence are positioned to get you to drive along an invisible wall. The game has been training you to use glitches to do things that shouldn't seem possible. So can we even call them glitches then? This isn't a question of intention anymore, the game is specifically designed to teach the player to break its boundaries regardless of designer's intent. Can we even call these boundaries? What does it mean for a game to teach you to do things that should seem impossible? These are interesting questions that interrogate so much of what we take for granted when it comes to game design and criticism, and there's no other way these questions can be asked. It shows that glitches and imperfections aren't always something to be fixed, they're a part of the game. They make the game what it is. By this point, you might have asked yourself what an anodyne even is. The word has two literal definitions. One is a painkiller, and another is not likely to provoke dissident or offense. In Anodyne 2, the Anodyne is a cosmic event that your character, Nova, was created in order to bring about. You're told by your creators that the Anodyne will clean all negativity, disease, and sadness from the world. It turns out, however, that doing this will wipe out all life on the planet. In the end, you have the choice to either go along with it, or save this imperfect world by challenging both your creators and yourself. The story, along with teaching you to break its supposed boundaries, are the game's method of telling you that life is imperfect, and that instead of fighting a losing battle to fix those imperfections, we should accept them as they are, and see what value they can give, in life, in art, and in ourselves. It's a genius approach to storytelling that simply couldn't be done any other way. It's bold, it's groundbreaking, it deserves way more attention, and it isn't even close to the wildest experiment I've seen a game take in glitchy design.
Dang, that's a pretty good video so far, don't you think? I hope so. So good, it just makes you want to see your name slapped on it, or watch it before it releases, or maybe even some other cool stuff. I have a Patreon now. If you like the work that I do, then you can get access to even more cool shit by becoming a patron. You'll get early access to videos, and access to working in unfinished scripts to check out what goes on in these videos behind the scenes. And of course, you'll be listed as a credit in all my videos going forward. Though I don't just mean rolling your name in the credits at the end. It'll probably be something a little more... Aesthetic. Similar to what I'm doing right now. And who knows, if we get enough people, I really want to put together a Discord server and do some Q&As with you guys. I think it'll be a good time. And of course, any money you give will go towards making these videos even better. So if you want to see this channel and community grow, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash midnightcowboy. Or give to my coffee if that's more your thing. Oh yeah, if you're photosensitive or sensitive to loud noises, maybe skip to this timecode. Otherwise, maybe still turn your volume down a bit. Spiel is a game that refuses function. It rarely, if ever, does something a game is supposed to do. On the surface, it seems like merely a series of scenes, loosely chopped together with jittery textures, screen tears, a camera that gets stuck in uncanny positions, and a soundtrack that sounds like an LED laser stuck on a broken opera record. The game is an asset flip, in the sense that it's largely compiled of stock Unity assets that don't even try to seem cohesive together. One of the levels is a neon-dripping, high-fantasy warp of Kakariko Village from Ocarina of Time. Only now, you're a bear collecting rupees by breaking in and out of the game's textures at impossible angles. And in the end, you're on the bridge outside the village, you're a dog now, arguing over labor rights and the energy of the universe with SWAT team members and a translucent bear, and also Pluto? And the story of Orpheus and Eurydice and Tristram Shandy and... How did we get here? The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman is a novel published over nine volumes from 1759 to 1767. In total, the novel is several hundred pages long, and is effectively a biography of the main character Tristram Shandy as told by himself, all of which takes place during the birth of his son, also named Tristram Shandy. The novel does this through endless digressions, ellipses, double entendres that lead into associative histories between the novel's characters, and so many other poetic devices stretched over absolutely absurd lengths of time. It's also chock full of multimedia devices, throwing in songs and musical notation and seemingly unintelligible symbols, and sketched outlines of the novel's own structure to complement the writing's similarly abstract style. Early on in the novel, Tristram Shandy recounts the death of his father, which the novel itself laments with two whole pages of nothing but endless black ink. To say that the novel Tristram Shandy was ahead of its time is an understatement. The novel invented so many qualities of postmodern literature hundreds of years before there was even a modern to be post about. It's a work that's so inexorably tied to its medium that it's practically impossible to adapt, but that hasn't stopped artists from being inspired by it for hundreds of years. Orgespiel is clearly trying to do something similar, only in the medium of video games. The alternate title of the game is The Dog Opera, and uses stock animal models in order to highlight the absurdity of the very human struggles that it deals with. Specifically, this game is very concerned with global warming and labor exploitation, and how they transform us into something that denies us the unity that is so essential to living in our universe. In fact, in order to even buy the game, you need to visit a website that asks you to input the number of people in your household and your annual income. But if it's too expensive, it's okay, you can spin these windmills to make the game as cheap as you want. 
it might be tempting to say that the game follows dream logic, which is basically what reviewers say when they don't want to actually analyze the game's narrative. In reality, the game simply has so many different ideas it wants to tackle, and uses various different symbols to represent them. One of the game's many narratives is about a team of dog game developers who are developing Oikospiel in an attempt to create the Geospiel, with Eurydice and Orpheus composing the soundtrack and the overall goal of bringing the world into unity. There's a labor protest led by countless animals, a family whose house is a room in a shapeless airplane. There are several full books that you can read in the game, Frankenstein, Leviathan, Franz Kafka's Investigations of a Dog, and there are multiple segments where the very ground you walk on is a sheet of music that plays as you walk over it. The game even has a novelized adaptation of itself that comes with it. There's a mad, abstract synthesis of game, music, literature, visual art, and so on in this game because it wants to take the unity rallied for among workers and show what that looks like on a universal scale. And in doing so, it is endlessly, unavoidably, glitchy. Which isn't a knock against the game. Glitches don't break the game, they're part of the way the game communicates its ideas. This world is in chaos, torn apart by rampant individualism that keeps people, objects, entire continents, and even ideas separate from all else so they can be more easily exploited. Orkishpiel looks and feels like a mishmash of textures, colors, sounds, models, because the game is trying its best to unite pieces of reality that have been separated for so long. It's trying its best to piece together its world from what's left over, and show what we can learn when the limits of our current society and perception are removed. And it is striking. It's also a mess. There are parts of the game where the camera will position itself in completely unusable positions. There's one chapter in the game that seems to have a point of no return. The only Let's Play I've been able to find of it online also gets stuck on this multi-planar dimension for almost half an hour, and the three other comments say they got stuck on the same part before just skipping to the next chapter. But it's also a section where you climb on narrow textures far into the sky, and see this tiny dimension shrink as you take on the vast expanse of empty skybox that surrounds this tiny, united world. Even when we bring our world together, we are all floating in the sea of an infinitely large universe, infinitely expanding. <laughs> It's not a neat game, but no game that does what Oikospiel does could ever possibly be. It embraces imperfections inherent to game design, and as a result, creates a game unlike any game ever made. Glitches hold more power in game design than we often give them credit for. Now, I don't mean this in a completely free-form, associative manner. When Cyberpunk 2077 first released, many players' as PCs buckled so heavily under the weight of the game that it completely bricked their computers, so I think there is some line to draw where glitches are inarguably bad. But the question of what a glitch even is, and whether designers should try to fix them, is something that I think deserves a lot more genuine consideration. I don't think there's anything wrong with calling them glitches. I think it's a very flexible term, and one that is so culturally tied to video games that it'd be pretty naive to just get rid of it. But the term needs to be regarded with the neutral connotation that it rightly deserves. Because if we continue to regard glitches as inherent flaws in a game, then we hide ourselves away from the potential of games to direct their own design. We block out all potential that imperfections or unexpected design choices have in communicating radical and groundbreaking ideas. We bury ourselves in a pile of conventions and expectations, and delude ourselves into believing that we are each a surgically removed piece of the world we live in. Or, I don't know, just broaden your idea of what deserves critical analysis, so we can recognize more games for the quality that they have. Now this, this is quality. Fuck yeah. <laughs>